when this profession gets its act together and, and acts decisively in a unified way, I think it can move mountains. Good morning, Ian. Good morning, Peter. How are you? I'm very well indeed. How very kind of you to give up your time this morning to talk to me. Where do you see chiropractic in the world of healthcare in Europe, both now and in the next few years? Well, first of all, Peter, it's a delight to talk to you, and I'm a great admirer of the society, and we'll come on to that uh, a little bit later. Um, where do I see chiropractic in the world of healthcare? Uh, it's a young profession, let's be honest. I mean, 125 years is nothing. In, in the history of, of uh, medicine. Uh, and so I think the position varies very greatly indeed. I mean, there's clearly a very strong presence in North America, both in the United States and in Canada. There's a reasonably strong presence in some parts of Northern Europe, particularly uh, Scandinavia. Uh, and um, apart from that, and, and apart from that, actually quite patchy, I think, and that's partly a uh, product of, of history. Uh, clearly, the, the best part is that the kind of treatment that chiropractors offer are rec is recognised in most clinical guidelines for the treatment of MSK uh, conditions, and particularly a low back pain. And that that is a great opportunity, clearly. But frankly, there are just too few chiropractors in Europe, and I'm going to from now on only really talk about Europe, but there are just too few chiropractors uh, to take advantage of that. And that's, that's a great shame at the moment because no one profession actually owns the future. The future has to be taken and it has to be molded. And to do that, I think you have to move quickly and frankly, you have to look and drive through the front windscreen and not constantly looking in the rearview mirror. And the chiropractic profession has a tendency from time to time uh, to look in the rearview mirror and argue about which road they've come from rather than look through the front windscreen and decide which road they're going to. So I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing is uh, the profession has to some extent and certainly needs to reinforce a leadership that understands the cards that it holds in its hand and how to play them. Uh, and it needs a bulk membership, if you like, that is prepared to be a team player. And what I mean by that is not just to be excellent in themselves, but to make the rest of the team excellent as well. Uh, as you know, I was born in Manchester, I was actually born in Oldham, but I lived, went to school in Manchester. Uh, and if you take the great football teams of Manchester, and let's take Manchester City at the moment, the reason they're so good is not because they have really good players and Guardiola makes them even better. It is because he instills on them that part of their responsibility is each one of them to make the other 10 better as they play. And that makes it beautiful when they play on form and it makes them irresistible when they play on form. And I think that's the kind of team playing that the profession needs. Um, because after all, you know, all chiropractors basically benefit from the tenacity and the sacrifices of the past. And that means they have a responsibility to leave the profession in a better shape than when they found it. And that is, I think, the fundamental belief that will drive the profession forward in the healthcare world. Whether it becomes part of what in the UK is the National Health Service, but is different, obviously, in different countries, will, will depend on uh, where they are. But that's both where I think they are and how I think they need to drive to get where they want to be. Right. Well, I see that. I mean, that's very interesting. And of, of course, it's it's about um, respecting your heritage, but uh, seeing what the opportunities for the future are. Um, and the trouble is that an awful lot of people find themselves pulled in one direction. And, and, and there's, there are rifts which form within groups within the profession because of their heritage, rather than uh, what the opportunities um, provide. So that leads quite nicely into the next question, which are the strengths and weaknesses. So the main strengths and also um, perhaps what we've already alluded to is the weaknesses of the profession from your perspective. Okay. 
I see all of this strengths and weaknesses, and I've, I've done a lot of work on this everywhere, as two sides of the same coin. Actually, a strength can be a weakness and a weakness can be easily, well, not easily, but it can be turned into uh, a strength. Uh, it, but if I start with the strengths, I've actually been really genuinely impressed by when we have a convention, the sellout nature of the workshops. I mean, you know, they're crowded. People are standing, not literally in the aisles, but against, against the walls. And that's an indication of a real thirst for improvement amongst the individual chiropractors who bother to come to conventions, and I'm sure it's you know, elsewhere. So that, I think that is very much a strength that the individual wants to become better at what they do and is prepared to put time and effort into that. I think the second thing is that the patient satisfaction rating of chiropractic is extremely high. And if I go back to you know, playing the cards in your hand, that's an ace in the hand, there is absolutely no doubt at all about that. But it seems to me that that's not enough. And to say that the profession is patient centered is not enough to move the chiropractors from the substitutes bench onto the field and playing you know, every week in the, in the health service game, if you like. Um, I think another strength is that we invest the ECU, that is, invests 25% of its income into research. Uh, and that is clearly good. I think we need to broaden the range of researchers that receive money. Uh, and above all, we need to improve the innovation that should follow on research. We're really not that good at taking the, most la the latest research and, and putting it into the clinic. Uh, if you like. And that's not, actually, it's not the blame of the clinicians. It's the other way around. I mean, it's the people who should be doing the communication uh, that we need to be looking at. Um, although there is some kind of slight tendency, I think, to dismiss new things and say, uh, oh, we're, we're already expert. Um, and we have to worry about that because actually innovation isn't a light bulb moment. It's, it's graft actually, and it's a lot of people to, uh, working at it to get critical mass. Uh, and I think that is really what we ought to be doing. So we, we shouldn't be too strident in dismissing ideas uh, because I think most of the innovation that happens in the world happens long before you can explain why in scientific terms it, it is happening, which I should hasten to add right at this minute is not to say that I would tolerate or in any way um, condone extreme claims uh, that are about. I mean, we, we keep, let's keep this into uh, perspective. Unfounded and, and, and extreme claims certainly don't have that. But, you know, when, when this profession gets its act together and, and acts decisively in a unified way, I think it can move mountains. And I, I quote a couple of examples. Uh, well, maybe actually three. The first is the Belgian chiropractors, uh, when they were trying to get exemption from VAT from their government and failing and the government overriding them every time, didn't give up. They took it to the Euro European Court of Justice. And they won a judgment there that you did not have to be regulated in order to get VAT exemption. And that, of course, runs in every country in the EU, EU and all those that follow the EU rules. That is tremendous. That's a mountain. I mean, a hell of a steep mountain, actually, that's been moved. Yeah. So there's no doubt about that. Uh, I think the second example I quote is the, the Spanish Association, the AEQ, who earlier in this year won a case where the physiotherapists who are regulated in Spain and the chiropractors are not, had um, prosecuted a chiropractor, not for the first time, for practicing physiotherapy without a license. Now, historically, when they'd done it, they'd won. And in fact, the chiropractic concern was sentenced to two years. Um, I remember. The, yeah, you probably remember it well. Now, this time, the AQ fought harder and they won. And they won to an extent where the physiotherapists did not appeal against the judgment. That is a tremendous victory in Spain, no question. Yeah. 
uh, of that. And the third, and perhaps you know, the one that you and I can be most proud about, actually, is the track record of your society, this society, the SBCE. I mean, you have stimulated the creation of three new chiropractic courses in state universities uh, at a time when no other country in Europe has created a school, and some of them have been trying 15 years. Uh, now, it's partly to do with the structure of universities and the difference between the UK, which is much more a kind of business operation than some of the state funded universities in Europe, where uh, if the state won't put up the, uh, up the money to start, there's no nothing you can do. And that is clearly a very, very real problem. But let's, you know, let's not beat about the bush the creation of three uh, new universities and bringing the total up to what six out of the 11 uh, accredited ones in europe is a very very great strength so lots of strengths but i think the weakness is the will to build on those strengths and that's where we need to put more effort yeah well, that, of course, is uh, um, what we're trying to do now, is to build on the, on the track record that is there. I think the, the research is a really interesting topic that you've touched on, because one of the things, one of the reasons for going for state-funded uh, programmes is, and the difference between the state-funded programmes and the private colleges, which is the model principally in North America, yeah. is that when you're in a state-funded organisation as an academic, at least a third of your work has to be research-based. Absolutely. And so you've got to do it. Whereas an awful lot of the people teaching in private colleges can get a buy with either supporting something or being part of or a co-author, but not actually doing any innovative work on their own on their own bat. So I think that is one of the things which attracted me to this pro project. And it was surprisingly easy once you start the ball rolling to get the university is interested because actually it's a very easy sell um, because there are a lot of people out there who want to get into healthcare uh, and this is an option that gives them the opportunity to join a profession um, and also to join a profession which will provide them with a pretty secure and good living provided they keep their nose clean. So from the point of view of, of uh, stimulating it within the university sector that wasn't difficult. As you say there is a difference in the model here in the UK yeah. and then elsewhere. Yeah. But what's interesting is we've got two state funded universities in the USA now who have come to us. Oh, well. very good. Yes. So you know, we might start, and, and uh, the last interview I did was with Bruce Walker down in Australia. Oh, yeah. They had this model well established. Yes. So I think we are, this is a wave that we could ride for a bit. And, um, and on the back of that, you then start to address the primary problem that you um, highlighted, which there just aren't enough. And if we can be producing maybe 60 or 70 more chiropractors a year in the UK, and we can stimulate other countries to think about this as a model for their uh, universities, because an awful lot of the UK universities have reciprocal arrangements with European-based universities. And we'll see what happens post-Brexit, but I still think there's going to be quite a lot of collaboration across the academic world. So, you know, I'm quite, I'm quite optimistic about that side of things. But I think, um, yeah. leading me on to the next question. Um, well, just before we leave that, Peter, I think yeah. two comments. It's an interesting paradox, isn't it? That in the state universities, the problem is getting the academics to teach because yeah. all they want to do is spend their time researching. And in the private colleges, it's exactly the opposite. Yes. And so somehow we, we have to do that. But I think, I mean, there are, there is an appetite to grow. I mean, very interestingly, we the ECU gave a grant uh, last November to Switzerland for a, a massive increase in the take up of uh, places in the University of Zurich. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing there is that the the challenge is that uh, certainly in, in Zurich, the challenge has been you have to show there is a demand for the for student places before the university will take the plunge and increase the capacity. So th the grant is to create the demand and partly to do it in the German speaking Zurich, but also do it in the French speaking bit of Geneva. Uh, and so I, I mean, it, it's basically saying it's horses for courses. But yeah. there is massive opportunity there, and good luck to you, society, and and people who run the universities at the moment. Well, I mean, and and to stay on that theme for a moment, we were very sad that the 
pandemic meant that the Utrecht conference had to be cancelled because of course yeah. we were hoping to be um, a, a part of that, um, not not on the main programme, but as a sort of uh, yeah. fringe, a fringe group. Um, and I hope that we will still have the opportunity to do that, even though the BCA may not be part of the ECU next time the ECU has a convention. Uh, we will make an application to the ECU to see if we can still come and make a presentation because I think we are still relevant to Europe, even though the BCA won't be part of the ECU. Um, well, I would add an E to your acronym and make it the SPCEE, and the last E would be European. Well, we could do that. That's a very good idea. I shall make a note of that. Right, okay. That, well, might, I mean, that might come up at our next board meeting, because I think right. that sounds like a very... Uh, I, 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 I think the innovation associated with it is, uh, is good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, the, the more you are involved in universities outside the UK, the easier it will be for the ECU to justify giving you platform time. I am sure they will want to do so right. because educa education is one of the pillars of the ECU strategy and uh, it, it's, it comes under advancing the profession. And uh, our academy now is focused as much on education, if not more, than on research. Hmm. So well, good luck with that. Well, okay. I'll, I'll, if I can help, of course I will. I'll take that on board. That sounds to me a very that, that sounds a fertile a fertile piece of ground. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, if we look then at what do you think the strategies for the profession, I suppose we have probably largely covered that. But well, um, I'd like to add some stuff. Good, please do. Uh, and I mean, first of all, I I actually quite like to wave the flag for the ECU because the ECU adopted what we're now calling a AAA strategy in November of 2019. And the AAA stands for, the first A stands for appropriate MSK care. And that is care that is built on science, but also experience and what the patient wants. But also appropriate care that doesn't go in for unnecessary procedures, whether they be scans or anything else. So that's the first A. Uh, the second A, and I think is an important one, is care that is accessible to the citizens of Europe. I mean, there are black holes in Europe where there are very few chiropractors for massive, uh, massive population. And, and the most obvious example of that is Germany. Yeah. It, you know, it is really pretty awful that for a country that is so economically and politically dominant in Europe, that the chiropractic profession is very, very small indeed. And that needs a massive expansion of people coming into chiropractic uh, and an approach that says we are keen to educate chiropractors from anybody who has the ability to be a chiropractor. Well, I think in order to be accessible in countries where the ratio is poor, and it's not that good in the UK, mm. uh, we have to be prepared to offer chiropractic education to anyone who has the ability to make it work and benefit from it. And quite frankly, that is not the case at the moment. And it's not the case because of what the third A in the AAA strategy stands for, which is affordable. And it is not just that uh, patients, it has to be affordable because in most of Europe, they pay for themselves, uh, whether it be through insurance or self-funded. Uh, and the, even in the best of them, there is some concern that the poorer patients are excluded by this. But it is equally, if not more true, in the education that until we get into public state, uh, state funded universities, it's really quite expensive to become a chiropractor, uh, particularly because, of course, the time uh, takes quite a long time. Uh, long time to get to get through uh, and that's really very very important and one of my heroes of business is uh, Mr Matsushita who founded the Matsushita Corporation and at one point Toyota I mean, he made he, he was making lights for Toyota cars and at one point Toyota said look we're having a hard time we can't continue unless you do something about it and he stood up in front of the 
assembled workforce and said our strategy for next year will be first of all to make things one third quicker then to make them one third better and to make them one third better value for money and we will do that year on year on year on and we all know what happened and the Matsushita Corporation massively successful brilliant strategy and I think we do have to make chiropractic uh, affordable um, so the three legs then that that strategy is focused on is, is, is first of all, getting the chiropractic message out and that still has to be done. Secondly, deepening the scientific base and getting more researchers, but not just drawn from the typical researchers that we have at the moment. And thirdly, advancing the profession. What those mean, it seems to me, this is where we come down to what the strategy should be is, first of all, I think, the, the profession needs a strategy for campaigning and campaigning on the back of real substance. There's a slight tendency to repeat mantras. Uh, you know, we are the best or whatever because we educate longer or whatever. That won't cut it. It's got to be campaigning that actually has some substance uh, behind it. And part of that, I think, campaigning is to embrace data wholeheartedly and systematically, and not just within an individual country, but let's get them all together and let's have, I mean, a European data and let's have a world data uh, about chiropractic. It, as you know, because Utrecht was canceled, we instituted what we're calling the lockdown series where a number of the key presenters did videos for us and we're showing them at a regular interval. The first one was Greg Kauchuk, uh, it went out on the 2nd of December. And his was about data, but the key phrase he said was, data is the new oil. It will lubricate economic growth and it can lubricate the growth of chiropractic. And I think that enables us to be responsive to the skeptics and actually to be able to say to other healthcare workers who are embracing data big time, that you know, we are happy to be judged on a par because we, the chiropractors, have something offer, to offer. So that's the second. Third one, which I feel very strongly about, is we have to improve the diversity of people in the profession and who the profession serves. The profession at the moment is too white and too middle class. And I mean, I actually heard recently a chiropractor who moved their practice to a quite big town in Europe saying, I walked around and saw where the big houses were and I put my clinic near to them because those are the people who will be my clients. Very good business strategy, but it says it all in terms of why we have to improve the diversity. And then I think, third, fourthly, uh, we have to, as I hinted before, we have to go in for much more innovation. And that is partly in education. And, and paradoxically, I think COVID has been a real blessing to the education world, including chiropractic. I mean, I did a survey of the uh, European schools and what was fascinating was how quickly they had moved to online teaching, usually begin within a week of the first lockdown, they had trained their teachers to, um, to teach online. And there'd been a kind of reverse. The students were actually teaching the teachers how to educate online in a number of these things. So, so online courses, and that opens up the possibility of much greater use of conversion courses and much greater use of part-time courses. That's quite controversial at the moment because of the challenge of maintaining standards. But fine, I mean, that's a challenge. Let's overcome that challenge. But unless we have conversion courses and we have part-time courses, we are going to fail both on the diversity side and on the growth side for the profession. It is the only way of doing it. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be stuck in very, very modest growth. You might rem I don't know if you remember, but you probably have heard of the course that was started at Surrey University. I, do, I have heard of it, and which closed. And it was closed, and that was a, a, effectively a conversion course. Yes, it was. Graduate. AECC is currently looking... It is. At, it's at, very controversial. 
It is controversial. Uh, and it's one of the things that I've talked to with all of the universities that we've been opening with, so South Bank, Teesside and Preston, is looking at the prospect for them having conversion courses for, because that's the first, I think, the first step. If you can get the profession to accept that people who train through that format can be equally as competent and capable of delivering the service as those who go through the normal channels, then you can start to get onto the uh, part-time elements too. And that's certainly one of the questions I've been asking all the educators that I've been talking to is how are they, what, what, what's their um, strategy for increasing diversity? Not gender diversity, because interestingly, no, gender no. diversity is, is pretty good. It's fine. It's not that at all. No, it is white middle class. You're absolutely yeah. right. And um, uh, and we certainly need to, to, to broaden that because um, if you don't broaden that, you're uh, effectively um, reducing the access of probably 40% of Europe's population. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's all those people who cannot afford to give up their full-time job yeah. in order to go five years into a course, which is quite expensive. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's, it's extraordinary. And I think it is very, very important indeed mm -hmm. that we do this. And I think there, there are, I think there are two keys to this. The first is that all of us have a slight temptation to think that when we qualified in whatever we qualified in that was the gold standard that was the best years absolutely and we have to stick at that gold standard and actually it's not right uh, you know the world moves on and so i think that one needs to look at the competencies that are coming out of education not necessarily the input that, well, that was very very clearly understood by the medics because of course junior doctors used to have to work 70 plus hours a week yes um, exactly just because we did that they've got to do it sort of thing yeah. And, yeah. and actually it was dangerous and the quality of care was poor and the motivation of the junior doctors was poor the whole thing was 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 being undermined by that simple principle and then to change that and say no no junior doctor can work more than 40 hours a week and suddenly the quality of care has gone up the accessibility the interest all of that so it is interesting and sometimes it's not a very not a very big tweak and you can get it you can get a change it's a nudge isn't it all of these things are nudges and that, and that's the thing that one one ought to i mean make it welcome hmm. make and it's it quite repeatedly welcome. nudging so you nudge a bit yeah. and then you nudge a bit yes. further um and so long as you don't expect things that are unattainable you can get somewhere it's when you when you, when your expectation is is just too far that uh, that people yep. resist it yep. uh, and then you have to go like the belgians one would have said that their expectation was too great but they took it to a court and got a ruling that shows a a, a sort of a, but it, but that's, that's escalating different. the that's conversation <laughs> you were trying to advance something rather than to keep something as it is now or has been in the recent past. And of course, the other key, is, it's not just uh, the, the competence that comes out. The other key is actually how your, your selection procedure for entrance into this course, because as, as a university, actually you want people to succeed. You want them to pass. You don't want them to fail. You don't want dropouts uh, because that rebounds on you badly. So you have a vested interest in selecting people who are likely to benefit from conversion or part-time. So in a sense, it can be golden. You can, you can be working at the interests of the university and at the interests of the profession and at the interests of people, frankly, for whom it will be life-changing. Mm -hmm. I have actually seen it in uh, at least one, if not more, graduation ceremony where you suddenly looked at people and thought, why this is the most important moment in their life. Yeah. Well, and I think I, also the other thing which medicine has also realised, but this concept of, of the only filter is academic credential. Yeah. So you get uh, AAA students. That's great. So you get a whole load of very, very bright kids in medical school, but they're actually not necessarily the best clinicians. So you need some very bright people, of course, because that's going to uh, feed into the academic world. But you also need people who are going to be competent clinicians. And that's not always the straight A student. 
Uh, no, I mean, particularly, I don't know what proportion of medical students become general practitioners, but it must be quite high. And uh, for that, you could argue that actually empathy and understanding and, and ability to listen is yeah. more important. Hugely where, more important. Hugely more important. Whereas yeah. one hears that in some and other disciplines of, of medicine, it's not quite so important. That's <laughs> <all right. laughs> but there we go. Right. Well, I think I think that sort of get, has given us a fairly good strategic outlet I, right. I, from your perspective. So, if you look back at your time at the ECU, what, what do you just reflecting on the highlights and 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 maybe some of the bits that you would like to revisit, or if you had the opportunity, um, might change. <laughs> yes, right. Okay, um, there have been many highlights actually, uh, and I've enjoyed it immensely. I mean, it's five and a half years has flown by, and that 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 sort of sells a story in itself. But I mean, if you look at, at the advancement of the profession over the five and a half years, clearly the publication of the Lancet papers in 2018 was a major milestone, which anybody associated with chiropractic whatsoever uh, can would regard as a highlight. Um, following on from that, I think the presentation in February 2019 to the MEPs in Brussels was a highlight, not because of the number of MEPs who turned up, because frankly, there weren't very many, but it was streamed and there were 20,000 entries into that streaming. Uh, the numbers uh, are slightly, you have to be careful because if, if you had a, had a you know, you're in clinic, and if you tuned in in between patients three times, that would count as three in the 20,000. So we have to be careful, but it's still a very good record of people showing interest. I think, you know, blowing slightly blowing my own trumpet, I think when I launched the ECU app, um, that was a major advance in terms of social media and connection with clinicians because I built it around the idea that we would only promote once a day and it would be at roughly the same time each day, which was probably around coffee time each day. And it would only broadcast things of substance and they would be digestible within a five minutes at the most. That is, I think, a very important point in, in communication. And there are over 3000 people have downloaded the app, uh, which is, you know, encouraging. I think also with that, and this is not my initiative, but very proud of and very high, uh, high moment was when Gen C was launched as a quality CPD provider uh, of equipment. And that was great. And I think probably, probably last, but by no means least, something I've alluded to, the agility of the chiropractic schools in responding to the COVID panic and, and problem with online teaching and the resilience of some of the associations, but sadly not all of them, in helping their members through uh, the crisis and in getting into a position where the profession could be used, seen as people who A, offered a safe environment and B, could relieve some of the strain on the GPs and on particularly on the A&E departments of uh, hospitals. And uh, I mean, it was very touching when I saw in Spain that when the clinic associated with Barcelona College opened there, to begin with, there was a trickle of patients, but within a week, that trickle had turned to a flood and they were sort of saying, gosh, this is terrific. And people were saying, do you know what? We've, we heard that you are taking great precautions to safeguard your patient. And actually, if I go to a and &E, I'll be amongst people probably who may be asymptomatic and uh, have COVID, and it's safer to come here for my MSK. That, that was actually a perverse high point, if you <laughs> like, if, if I'm looking at that. Um, well, now the low point. Well, I mean, clearly the BCA leaving or announcing it was uh, a low point. And uh, it was a low point, I think, in, in, the in the sense of betrayal of the solidarity that the other ECU members had shown in disrupting their holidays and in voting uh, to give quite a generous uh, offer to the BCA. And frankly, after 88 years as a you know, founder member, it, it is a sad moment. And uh, my own view, 
it, perhaps a slightly old fashioned view, is that it's not a good idea to insult the people with whom you're trying to negotiate. Um, so that was undoubtedly a uh, low moment at all. Um, I think otherwise there haven't actually been. I mean, there's a, I think probably an underlying concern, if it's not quite a low moment, concern is the willingness to get involved up close and personal with other healthcare professions. And especially, you know, the two obvious ones are the physios and the osteos, but the general practitioners as well, uh, and to talk to the general practitioners. I happen to have my own general practitioner is a great fan of chiropractic and uh, it goes regularly to treatment uh, by a BCA member uh, in Chiswick and speaks so volubly about the value that they can bring that, you know, you're thinking, well, you know, if she is of that nature, then, well, you know, that's, um, that's what we ought to be doing. We ought to be out there talking to the general practitioners much more so than we have in the past. Well, that, of course, is another reason for being part of the state-funded universities, because yep. the basic sciences, they're trained together. So at uh, South Bank, the physios and chiropractors are training for the first three years or two and a half years uh, yep. together. Uh, yep. And in fact, one of the things we're doing in the in UCLan in, in Preston is they've got a medical school. And we are hoping that we can um, share the first, the preclinical sciences or some of them with the medical students. So there's that again will help Absolutely. Not, a lot of it i'm afraid is a lack of confidence uh, intellectual confidence on the part of the chiropractic profession they don't want to engage in conversation because they don't all feel confident in their ability to that they, they 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 hide behind mantras often without actually engaging in the sort of constructive yeah. conversation yeah. Yeah. so that is certainly uh, one of the things that we are driving towards and and it's 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 an aspect of the driving through the rearview mirror i think because chiropractic kind of started by defining itself against others yeah uh, and it fought for recognition and it had terrible experiences with the medical profession in the united states uh, and that still lingers and and that has to be put behind us i think and i mean it's yes you you mentioned uh London South Bank and UCLAN, but I mean it happens also in Denmark, it happens also in Switzerland, uh, and so it's something that runs across Europe, uh, and, and that again is suggesting that the model that the society has adopted is the right model. Well, it's, I think it's the only way forward, and yeah. I think we've got quite a, I mean it's going to be a slow process um, to get things started, but once the you can show a track record of it working, then it's surprising how many yeah things can follow on. People think, well, that's, that's worked there. We can do this again. Um, and so success breeds success from that point of view, I hope anyway, that's what we're- Yes, I mean, another example perhaps is where uh, the uh, students in their final year or final years, uh, they go into hospitals yeah. as well as into clinics associated with where they're, where they're being taught. Uh, and then they suddenly discover the confidence that comes from actually, let's say, reading an X-ray of a back better than the doctor who's probably had two days or whatever it might be trying to learn how to do it. Well, actually, the other thing is that our skills in skeletal anatomy, particularly, yes. um, are so much greater than most medics who do yeah. anatomy for the first two terms of the first year of their course and thereafter leave it. So it's yeah. amazing when you start talking to doctors about um, osseous anatomy, um, how much better trained most chiropractors are in that so yeah and, and actually how welcoming the doctors can be oh yeah having somebody around who will help them get through that bit because I, I, I think most of the time i mean they're intelligent people they're yeah. they're usually not threatened by us um and and therefore there's no, no, and the reason that people get defensive is because they feel threatened by the person who's uh, who they're talking to the, yeah. the doctors don't feel threatened by us at all some of the no. physios do a bit, and some of the osteopaths feel a bit in competition, but... Yeah, that's uh, a different issue. Yeah, and uh, one we will have to uh, yeah. keep on addressing, I'm afraid. Ian, okay. is there anything else you'd like to talk about before we close? Uh, there's nothing else particularly I want to talk about, but if I can get the technology to work, I have made a 20 to 30 second video of what I think chiropractic contributes. <laughs> Thank you.
Ian, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's been a, a pleasure talking to you. Um, you've shed some interesting light on some areas that uh, perhaps others haven't because we've slightly changed the slant a bit in the interview with you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for all you've done for the profession too.